Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. Yo, what is up, guys? Welcome back to First Cut. This is our spoiler review of Loki Season 2. RB3 is here. RB3, you and I have been on the Loki train all the way back in Season 1, Episode 1. We were hyping up this show, and we were considering this show to be our favorite MCU show, at least when it came to Season 1. Now that Season 2 is over and has finally come to an end, how are you feeling about Loki as a whole, but specifically Season 2? Um, Loki is still my favorite show of the Marvel, uh, Marvel Disney Plus, you know, cine- you know, world, and and I think it's masterful filmmaking. I do think it's so funny. We just talked about the Marvels uh, just a second ago. I think it's almost the exact opposite of the Marvels for me, where I felt like the Marvels was a good story, a really fun story wrapped into a really badly executed, uh, particularly editing. It's not bad filmmaking, but it was just bad editing. Whereas I feel like low key, uh, season one is you know almost perfect to me, but season two is like brilliant filmmaking, amazing A list cinematography, but with a story that makes absolutely no sense. Like I rewatched that finale maybe two or three times, and I still had no idea what happened, like at all. And I just don't think like I just I just I want I am very conflicted because I want to admire the season, I want to love it. I think it's some of the best superhero filmmaking we've seen on TV since Legion. And I love, you know, I've raved about Legion endlessly on this channel. Like I love Legion and it's the best since that, but I just don't understand what happened right? in episode five or episode six. I just don't know, you know? So everything you just said is what I've been thinking this past. I mean, ever since the finale, but ever since this past four episodes, if I'm being honest, I, I kept thinking about it and I was like, what is happening like i really do feel like loki season two is the biggest testament of a marvel studio note becoming a six episode arc of a show Mm -hmm. that no one really knows what it's about Mm -hmm. and yet it's so well done Mm -hmm. that you're just kind of blown away by these writers by these uh directors by the Mm -hmm. cinematographers by natalie holt doing the music that you're just kind of like like literally if someone said hey guys you know season one was a great success for season two we're actually going to cancel it we don't really have anything going on so in this new season just try to make six episodes but make sure it's about really nothing but just try to make it as good as you can and i feel like that's what they were told and then the writers were like what do we do and they're like i don't know but let's just write loki goes back in time he's time slipping he does like they just made this all up and it's amazing because it feels like a giant studio note in six episodes, but it has so much emotion mm-hmm. and so much like, oh, you feel for Mobius, you feel for Sylvie, you feel, and you're just like, how did they do this? This show is literally about nothing right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're just going back to season one, but season two didn't really progress at all. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess the only progression is a little bit of Loki's character arc, but even then you can kind of see that in season one. Uh-huh. it's just i've never seen anything like loki season two it really yeah. was a, a one giant studio note dragged out for six episodes and yet they're just extremely well done yeah. uh, it, it's just hard to fathom i don't know if because i really do feel like if you really think about the show and the plot you're like wait a minute we didn't go anywhere it's a we just like we stayed in the same spot since season one uh it's incredible yeah, it's it's very it's very weird because I was looking forward to not only what Loki's journey was going to be, but the journeys of B fifteen, the journeys of Ramona Renslayer. I think Mobius, we did get a considerable amount of backstory for, and he does end up saying, "Yeah, I'm going to go back and uh, visit my boy." So I, I do think for Loki and Mo- Mobius, we got like more defined character arcs. But for everything else, I really don't know what happened. What, what about that actor guy too? Who what was his X five or something like that? What yeah, happened Brad. to him, Brad? Yeah. And then o- OB, I like that OB kind of had a little bit of an arc too. Like, but I still don't even really understand how Victor Timely supposedly inspired the TVA handbook, but inspired, but because they never really, I don't know. I don't know. It was just like a lot of answered questions. It's a lot of questions that were asked in the first four episodes that just kind of went away by episode five and episode six that, I don't know, it was just like whatever to me. Uh, but it, I don't know. 
Yeah, it's definitely strange. I, I do feel like the season one finale ends on such high stakes where you meet he who remains and mm -hmm. he says, hey, these timelines are going crazy. My Kang variants are about to pop out and we're about to start a war again. Uh, you know, that's your that's your choice now. And, and then they kind of go away from that in the first episode to where the timelines are going to explode or they're going to turn into just this giant bomb and explode all the other timelines where the idea of breaking the system or breaking the person who holds the system together, the uh, authoritarian leader is actually causing this new nuclear bomb of timelines. Wow. And that kind of goes away from what the first threat was initially supposed to be, which was supposed to be Kang. We end on season one with this statue of Kang, the conqueror, or a variant of Kang the Conqueror. So you think that that's going to be the new threat of season two. And we even start season one with Kang the Conqueror recording, talking to, or he who remains recording, talking to Renslayer. But, but that's the idea of what a threat is. And then eventually the threat just kind of fizzles away, becomes, you know, let's capture Victor Timely, let's fix the timeline. That's four episodes. Then by episode five, the timeline explodes. He goes back in time and then restarts the TVA by getting people that are already in our new time, our timeline, which is just 2025 or something like that. And, and I feel like that kind of goes away from what He Who Remains said, which was this was made by future tech. Didn't he say like 26th century tech or something like that? And I was like, I thought that's who created it. This future scientist, future Kane who is supposed to be the ancestor of Reed Richards. And he he made this using future tech, went back in time, created the TVA. It, it just felt like very much like they really had to scratch all that for some reason. I don't know if it's because of Jonathan Majors. I mean, right. obviously that's speculation, but I feel like they scratched a lot of what was there. And the writers came up with something completely new. And credit to the writers, credit to the filmmakers, because as I said before, it's actually really well done. Yeah. But it's just that the plot doesn't really have a lot of substance. Like I was explaining this to a friend of mine, and I was saying, like, imagine like someone telling you all these high stakes things, but then you see Loki sitting down at a bar with Sylvie having this heart to heart. As an audience member, you're just like, oh, man, I feel that. Oh, Loki. Oh, so like... Uh -huh. You're so caught up in the emotion that you don't realize, like, what is this show even about? Like, what's yeah. the plot right now? I don't know, but <laughs> this, this is emotional. I'm crying. So I guess it's good, right? Like, that's that kind of push and pull of this show that I really do feel like was kind of lost in the sauce of what a Marvel Studio note is, which I think this is the epitome of the biggest Marvel Studio note ever made. Um, and yet the finale was still really good in the sense that Loki makes his own timeline. We see him pull the timelines together and he becomes a right. new... That's what it was, right? That's yeah, how I took it as. I think, yeah. I think he made he a like, new sacred timeline. I mean, I think I took it as like he made a new loom. Like he made his own kind of loom that was able to handle the infinite timelines into like a tree kind of thing. Mm. That's the way I took it. Like I thought he took the thousands of timelines that were about to get eliminated and then brought yeah. them all together in one tree, maybe. I, um, I thought he was taking those new timelines that were about to get eliminated and then made a new sacred timeline because he who remains told him he's like this is the sacred timeline like you can't break this no matter what mm -hmm. like as long as you protect the sacred timeline and then he was like oh sacred timeline let me just make a new one a new sacred timeline using the same equation but protecting this new sacred timeline where i'm holding it together instead of he who remains so there's the loki second timeline and then there's the he who remains sacred timeline so that's how I, mean, I took it as. Yeah, I mean, really, they did not explain it. Like that's the, that's the that's the thing. Like they didn't verbalize what was happening. And then the show, and and I'm all for show don't tell. Absolutely, yeah. like I definitely like that. But you got to give me a little bit of indication of like what's going on. Like at least something. At least like when the B15 being like, oh, like the tree is like all the time. I don't know. Like the tree is like the sacred timeline. The tree is like all the time. Because I thought because the way I took it was like. He was trying, the way I took it, it was like, there's basically like no sacred timeline anymore. Like every, every timeline is a, is a timeline. Like basically like every timeline like coexists as one 
you, I guess, like one branch of a bigger tree. You know what I mean? Like, okay. So, you know, because because I figured the reason why I, I took that was because they keep saying branch timeline, branch timeline. So I'm guessing branch, tree, like a bunch of branches makes one tree. I don't know. Again, but it, that's the thing. It's like, it's very beautifully written and you could tell it's like poetic. I just don't know what it was. And then it's yeah. the same thing with like episode five, right? When, like you mentioned, they're at the bar talking about their heart to heart. You see OB yeah. talking to all this stuff about science versus fiction, like what's science versus what's fiction, quoting T.S. Eliot, like all these really deep, like brilliantly written passages of dialogue. But when you really think about it, it's like, what what does that mean? Like in the context of Loki. Uh, so I don't know. It, it was... It was good. It was uh, it was a good season of television, and the fact of like I just enjoyed the filmmaking. I enjoyed the Wes Anderson kind of inspired camera moves in some points, and the set design, but also just the wackiness of other times, like when they're in London during that movie premiere. Also when they're in Chicago during the World's Fair. Um, also, what was up with Miss Minutes? I thought that was a whole storyline that was supposed to go somewhere, but didn't end up going anywhere either. So I don't know. I just thought it was. It was interesting, and I enjoyed it as I was watching it. But in retrospect, I really just don't know what happened. At I, all. I, I just feel like again, I'll go back to my thesis. I feel like this is the biggest I, example of like a corporate studio note being like, "Hey guys, sorry, but everything you planned for season two, we're gonna have to scratch it. If you guys could just make a season two about something else." Just make it six episodes, make it as good as you can. Our apologies. We had this planned out, but now it can't really be about much. Just make it about the TVA and him wanting to have fun in the TVA. And then they were like, oh crap, we had all this planned out, but now we're going to have to write this story. Let's try to make it as best as we can. And they wrote something really good and substantial about, I guess, friendship and yeah. about keeping your 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 core values together, even though at your core, sometimes you were considered a villain. And, and at the end of the day, you saved your friends. And I think that was the message of the show, but it was never about the high stakes idea of facing off against the Kang variants and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then he made his own timeline. And that's where Sylvie says he's given us a chance talking about instead of destroying the the uh, variant timelines or the, mm -hmm. I forgot what they're called. Branch, um, branch timelines? Yeah, and instead of purging them, he was saving them, putting them together. So yeah, I, I just feel like this is a testament of of good writers, good filmmakers making a show that had a lot of chains on it, where oh, yeah. they were chained up to a wall, where they said you can only do TVA stuff, you can't do this, you can't do Kang stuff, you can't like they put them in a little box, and I feel like with that little box, they were able to make something really, really good considering all their restraints on themselves. But I do want to point out one thing before. Uh, we take off in this episode is the fact that this show started off RB3 as like a kind of course correction of what the TVA was supposed to be, right? Where in season one, we're in the TVA, we learn about the TVA. It took three or four episodes for us to learn about the character of Sylvie. And then when we meet Sylvie, we learn that the TVA is actually this authoritarian superpower that purges and destroys and kills billions if not trillions of people mm -hmm. and that they're actually the bad guys and yet in this entire season rb3 <laughs> the whole thesis of this season was like let's go back to the tva because we were wrong we can't destroy the system we have to work within the system mm -hmm. and they literally have a scene in, in episode four where sylvie talks to loki talking about where sylvie says just we should all restart the system and start again because it's taking away our rights it's taking away our freedom and it's killing people and then loki says something like oh that's easy to destroy it's it's harder to fix what's broken and you have to fix the system in order to make change and i'm like wait a minute marvel is doing it again <laughs> yeah they're doing to play both sides like yeah they're neutral. doing the whole yeah. like status quo like mm -hmm. we gotta we can't we can't go too far yo don't be a revolutionary don't try to be you know don't try to change yeah. the system. Don't try to destroy it. You got to work within it and try to make it better. You can't, you know, you can't break the TVA. You got to work within it because if you break it, all the timelines are going to explode. And I was like, 
this is what Marvel does, man, that I just I can't stand. I can't stand this idea of like an authoritarian superpower. And then they're like, well, actually, it's a good authoritarian superpower. We have to work within it. And maybe the leadership changes. It could all change. And I'm like, that's the point that. of the show. <laughs> right. Because we already saw like with people like Dax and like her whole military crew, like they were willing yeah. to disobey whatever leadership directives they were given, just like putting timelines on their own. So it's just yeah. an all around corrupt system from the from the top down. And that was another that was another interesting plot line too, right? Like seeing all of those soldiers ended up getting killed by uh, Ramona Renslayer, um, yeah. and that little crushing box. I thought that whole. Every time they went to that little crushing little orange thingy, that was crazy to me. Um, But then, uh, and then she just gets, and then Ramona just gets pruned, um, you know, by the end of that episode. But I personally thought we were going to see, you know how season five was like low key diving into the, to the pruned area. What would they call that? Uh, What was like the void or something like that? That was uh, where where he met like all the other versions of Loki. I thought episode five was going to be Ramona Renslayer going into that. And then, like, her having to figure out her way, find a bunch of other low-key variants or something like that, like... And Isn't I thought... where she went? I felt like that it looked just like that place, right? Yeah. And then but, that creature was that same mm-hmm, the same. Yeah, uh, yeah, that same thing, yeah. But I'm just like, they just... Did she just get eaten by that? Like, they, we didn't yeah, see her get she, eaten. She got, she got ate, I guess. I don't yeah, know. Eight. But I'm like, yo, but she's such a good character. Google not the rise. Like, such a good actress. Like, yeah. like why, why, why would you just leave that? Around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. That's where I was starting to get like a little bit. That I think like the first four episodes were such good filmmaking and storytelling that built up to a full story. And then episode five, it definitely felt like they had to make some changes. And I think they even came out and said they rewrote a, a lot of episode five originally. Um, but I thought that would have been some good changes. To I mean, that would have been a good way to progress Ramona's story. Probably B-15 because they established she was in 2012 New York during um, mm. um when she was like working in the hospital so i'm wondering like was her thing originally supposed to tie into the battle of new york maybe ramona's thing was supposed to be the snap i don't know i'm just like these are all things i'm just like kind of curious about but they don't really touch on it they just kind of like it's about low-key you know like you said working within the system it was just like it still didn't it still really didn't even prove to me that the TVA was really worth saving, like all across the board, right? Like the more, the more the story kind of unfolded, it's kind of like, yeah, why don't y'all just let this thing blow up? Like, yeah, but I don't know, I don't know. I don't it, know. it just feels like Marvel is really trying to spread this message, <laughs> yeah. and it's really trying to hammer it in, where they're like, don't go too far, don't you dare. You got to work within the system. You got to, you know, change the leadership, but you can't change the system. And it's like that ideology. And every time they introduce a figure that's supposed to represent the counter to that, they're shot down or they're considered super violent or they're considered extremist, but they're never actually followed through with that. Even with an actual authoritarian system that the TVA was supposed to represent, at the end of the day, it's a, it represents like a shiny beacon. All we had to do was, you know, change the paint a little bit and then put Loki in charge and instead of he who remains. And now it's you know, a happy go lucky place where people can choose if they want to go back to their lives um, instead of just being forced to do this and having their memories erased. And I felt like, I don't, I don't know if I like that kind of sugar coating of what they were trying to say in the first place, which again, they shot down and they kind of retraced their steps and literally replayed the season one finale. So yeah, which is a lot uh, of mixed thoughts for me. Yeah. Yeah, which is which is which is very funny because it definitely uh, I thought I thought it was gonna come full full circle with him going back to the battle in New York, like just the way they showed it in the little preview episode, you know, the episode preview, like the glorious purpose. But it, it did end up coming back in a beautiful way with Morbius, like saying that, like um, what's more bird, you know, what's more burdensome than purpose or something like that. It was a really good line that he put. Um, I will say. Jonathan Majors is Victor Timely, kind of cheesy, kind of over the top. I liked it, but, you know, it was kind of goofy. But when he was playing He Remains, like, even in that last episode, and I hate saying it's about a guy who could potentially be a piece of crap or whatever, but, man, he was back to cooking, bro. I'm like, yo, I could see why <laughs> Marvel had you, like, even from way back in. Like, this is... He was great in the season one for now, remember? Yeah, yeah, That yeah. character was great. Yeah, character was great. And, yeah, the way he was playing it 
And this one, um, also another funny scene from season two, like very small moment, but I think Miss Minutes or something was glitching out in front of Victor Timely and she started stuttering. And he was like, well, you don't have to be rude. And it just was so funny, like seeing he's just like so insecure about that little stutter that he has. Um, it was good, man. It was, it, it was good stuff. I do just wish it made sense or it, it built up to something that was something that, you know, was continuous, but I get it. They're trying to probably, they probably did see the Jonathan Majors legal situation and was like, let's pare down the cane a little bit. Um, they probably thought, you know, we've seen uh, like, you know, we, we, we've already had a bunch of other content referencing the battle of New York or the snap and stuff like that. We don't really want to do that anymore. Like, let's really just keep it only on low key and that's it. And it's like, it's okay. It's also a testament. I know I gave a lot of credit to the directors and the uh, filmmakers and the um, writers and all that, but I, I do have to give credit too to um, Tom Hiddleston. A, a lot of credit goes to him because I feel like his performance was like taking the show so seriously. Mm. And, and it was so funny to see, I think it was episode five or it might've been the finale. It, it was funny to see the finale and to see his super serious, like the world is about to explode type of um acting compared to uh victor timely yeah <laughs> when he was hot when he was hugging victor and he's like victor we did it victor and victor's like we we did it loki and it was like very yeah. like t- a, a person is taking he's like in game of thrones and victor mm. timely is like in a disney channel movie <laughs> yeah yeah no literally. literally and i was like this mismatch is crazy like i've never seen that kind of difference of acting where Jonathan Majors is just going ham as far as being as goofy as possible. And Tom Hiddleston just thinks, just thought he saved the world. I think it's when he pushed the prune back or whatever, the, the mm-hmm. looms back. Mm-hmm. Um, testament to him because he took it seriously the whole way. Yeah. And I don't know if everyone else did. <laughs> yeah. Not, uh, not even Ki, uh, Ki Huan Kwan. Like, he wasn't even taking it seriously. Like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Around, they were just like... so goofy. Yeah. yeah. But, I but think, he uh... was always like, serious he was always like this is the end of the world guys we have to do it so oh i think tom hilston is just like an amazing actor especially it's so funny because even if you go back and watch the first Thor movie his performance in that film is very very different than the performance that we get in this in this series like and Loki in the in Thor, he's playing more of like a bratty kind of arrogant like brother kind of situation. But it's still great in Thor, and it's and it's great here. It's been a great like fourteen year journey. Uh, and then uh, with uh, there was a yeah, it, 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 I, I think he's great, and I think the serious the seriousness of the show is good, but also like the blatant you know attack, attempts at comedy, stabs at comedy are also very good. Like I also think like. It's quietly funny in the way that they kept making Loki go back during that same day in like a, a Groundhog's Day kind of situation. Like, yeah. Or like centuries later, he's like an expert at uh, physics and stuff like that. I thought that was uh, actually pretty good, too. I felt like very I, th- I know the writer came from Rick and Morty. That felt like a very uh-huh. Rick and Morty kind of like kind of situation. Um, and then one other scene I really love, too, by the way, and just and then I'm done is with um, in episode five when the spaghettification started uh coming up to, or when Sylvie's in the record store and everything oh, starts yeah. spaghettifying and then uh the dude's like running towards Sylvie and he like reaches out her hand, his hand and then it just like spaghetti fies right in front of him right in front of her I thought that was brilliant I thought like that's when I was like wow this show regardless of where the story's going like it is hitting like it is going in skis on the filmmaking so it really is it, it really is again I keep going back to that that testament of what it is to hire incredible filmmakers. Again, the writers, the music producers, the uh, actors, just incredible filmmaking with a plot that's like this big. And it's like, make something out of this and they still do it. It's actually kind of phenomenal, incredible just to see it. I I just wish it could have been better. And I just wish the, the purpose of the show didn't reach another Marvel kind of retracing their steps where they're just like, whatever you do, kids, don't go too far and i'm like all right guys come on now like right. we gotta st- eventually we're gonna have to stop this but i, I guess it's only gonna get worse it's and like, now we're doing next ra- so right right don't be too radical don't be exact don't oh, be too gosh. radical that's gonna be you gotta oh. go out and vote it's <laughs> gonna be so nasty when we get like the Professor X versus, uh, you know. That's what I'm uh, saying. Like, I'm afraid of X-Men, bro. I'm afraid. I'm afraid, bro. I'm just afraid. 
<laughs> I, I'm just like, I can't. X Men is supposed to be the most like revolutionary type stuff. Yeah, they're gonna comics. make Ma- they're gonna make Magneto a shit up villain. Like it's not gonna oh. be no anti hero, nothing like ambiguous. He's gonna be like a killmonger, uh, basically. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're gonna have him basically... like crush like millions of people and stuff, and for for no reason, for no reason. for no reason. Yeah, yeah. It... <laughs> I don't know, man. They'll probably have an X Men do it too, so they can be like, look, we're wrong the whole time. Humans yeah. were right to hate us. Ugh. Right. That's the because that's the um that's what God. they did to your girl in um what was that the this uh, uh flag smasher and um yeah, Falcon and, uh, Winter Soldier, Winter yeah. Soldier. yeah she's it a was wolf that building out of nowhere <laughs> it was literally the most like written like character like they literally wrote that where they're like wait a minute this person cares about people this wants to spread love no we have to have her kill people randomly yeah. so people can hate her and want to kill her. <laughs> oh my god i hate that bro marvel can't do it bro i swear they can't oh well we'll take what we can get man but either way those were our thoughts on loki season two let us know what you thought in the comments down below rb3 where can everyone find you uh, you find me on twitter and instagram at director rb3 you can find me at squad leader ace you can follow us right here at first cut but either way guys for the first cut crew we're going to be peacing out so peace you you do the math, only one can remain.